Jesus is alive. Amen. I don't know if you recognize it, but Jesus Christ told some things to his people before he left. Amen. He said, you're going to go do what I've been doing. He said, the works that I do, you're going to do. And so Jesus is still alive and his words are still ringing in our ears. And so we're going to do the works of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> but to do the works of Jesus, we need to learn some things. We need to glean some things. We need to walk in the shoes of Jesus. We need to pretend. We need to pretend like we got to see him, touch him, ask him questions. Eyeball the miracles. So when you read the stories in the Bible, don't just count it as some bi a Sunday school lesson. Think of it as if it really happened. Look at it with your, the eye of your spirit and see all the intricacies of those miracles. And that's how you learn. Amen. So did everybody do your homework last, last week? What was your homework assignment? To sit and pretend that Jesus was speaking to you. To imagine... Looks like nobody did their homework. <laughs> Okay, I had to take my coat off. We had to get down to business here. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. To sit in the chair, in the quiet, and pretend that Matthew 10, verse 1 through 8 was for you. Pretend that Matthew 28 was for you. Pretend that Mark 16 was spoken straight from the mouth of Jesus to you. Hallelujah. And if you actually would sit here listening to the Master... He had his 12 and then he had a few others to sit there and him say, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, but I want you to go. You must go with the authority and power. You must do what I've been doing. You must go. I give you all authority and power. It's all been given to me. You go, therefore. Amen. Now, if he stood there and, and kind of grabbed you by the shoulders and shook you and said, now, win the lost and heal the sick people and get demons out of everybody. Mm -hmm. And I'll be back to get you later. That, that was it. That was it. Hallelujah. You'd be doing the works of Jesus, wouldn't you? So since you didn't get to see Jesus eyeball to eyeball like that, you have to pretend. You have to imagine it enough because of it, the printed word. That's called faith. That's called doing it by faith. They got to hear those words ringing in their ears, but you get to hear them ringing in your heart. And that's the secret right there. You can do anything with God if you'll... If you'll count the word that he wrote the same as if he spoke. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Do you have your Bible? Hallelujah. Open it with me somewhere. <clears throat> we ended last time with um, the description of Jesus that he had every piece of equipment needed to do the job. He had the commission. He had the authority. He had the sinless nature. He had the love of God. He had everything he needed, and he went out and did miracles. He went out. He went out. Everywhere he went, he did miracles. And that's what we have to get a mindset. We can't reserve miracles just for church time. Everywhere we went, we're supposed to have miracles. He allowed life to interrupt him with hurting people. One time he went to the well, and he was getting some water, and the lady showed up, and they had a little conversation going, and finally uh, she realized he was a prophet. He had a word of knowledge, and he delivered her from her predicament, and she was saved. She believed in the Messiah that day, just getting some water. I remember one time I was uh, going to buy uh, an engagement ring for my beautiful bride, and I was... Headed up to this same, I've been in this place for three weeks, man. I've been hassling with this guy, and I've been working to get the right diamond. And I was headed up there one day, and I was walking up the steps of this building, and this lady came hobbling out, came walking down the steps, and she's limping and hurting. And so I, I, I figured I better stop and talk to her, even though I had a, a mission. I, was on a, I had a plan. I mean, I was taking care of my wife. And um, so I talked to her for a little bit, asked her if I could pray for her. She said, well, I've been prayed for at church. And I said, well, I hadn't prayed for you yet. I said, you mind if I pray for you? And I prayed for her, and the power of God touched her, and she walked off not limping a bit, completely healed, completely healed. And so, you know, and then I went on and did my business and found the perfect diamond, just in case you were wondering. Hallelujah. We just have to be open. We have to be open and bold enough to interrupt our busy day, because I know all of you are extremely busy. Isn't that right? All right. <clears throat> Praise God. So uh, let's, let's take a look at this final part of key number one, which is the spiritual motivators of Jesus. You know, I grew up um, kind of with the image in my mind that Jesus worked miracles because He was God, and He did it to prove that He was God. 
And that was just the mindset that I was under uh, all those years. Excuse me? She says page four. That was the mindset I had that uh, <clears throat> Jesus was just proving that he was God. And so he was just going around, you know, poof, poof, poof. And just kind of doing it nonchalantly yeah. because he could. Yeah. And because he wanted to prove. Yeah. Well, you get in the Bible and you realize that's not why he did it at all. Matter of fact, he didn't want people to know sometimes that he had done things. His, his main message was not, I am the Son of God. Amen. That was not his main message. He did say it a few times to his disciples, but that was not his main message. His main message was, I have been commissioned and called by God to help you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And so let's find out what Jesus was motivated by. What did motivate Jesus? Was he, was he just kind of passing time while he was on the earth? Or did he have something inside him that motivated him? Yeah. Now we know he was motivated by the command of God and the commission and the sins of the world and the hurting humanity. But let's put it in, let's put it in real terms here. and Let's look at miracles and see if there was uh, any insight into the heart of Jesus. Because you can't just take the outside things and work miracles. You have to have the inside things. So we can't just mimic Jesus on the outside. We have to mimic him on the inside. And that's where we begin to, feel, we begin to see some spiritual uh, necessity that we have partaken of the nature of Jesus on the inside. So let's take a look here. Open your Bible with me to Matthew, please. Psalm 145, we won't turn there, I'll just quote it to you. It says uh, that the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and His tender mercies are over all His works. Hallelujah. So that's the nature of God is tender, merciful, and compassionate toward people. Everything God does has tender mercy on it. Amen. Well, that's the nature of God. That must be the nature of Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 14. <clears throat> One day I was reading a, I was reading a book uh, by Gloria Copeland. And she was describing something that had happened to her and that uh, God had had her read the Gospels plus the book of Acts three times within one month. And, you know, it helped her life at that time. And as I read that, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to do that. So I said, okay, I'll do that. And I read the book of Acts, I read the four Gospels plus the book of Acts three times in one month. And I read it through the first time, and the only thing that I could see, the only thing that jumped out at me all throughout was this revelation right here. And then I read it through again. And then I found more examples. And I read it through again. Three times I read it through, and this is all that I could see. This was exactly what God wanted to show me. And it was the fact that Jesus was motivated to do miracles by the divine love of God. Amen. He was motivated by compassion for people. That's right. The word compassion in the New Testament is the same for mercy. They're, they're equal. So let's, let's look at a couple examples here and see if that's true. I mean, it is true, but I'll just, we'll see the scriptures. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. When Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them. And he healed their sick. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. He was moved with compassion and he worked, he worked the miracle. He did the miracle. He helped people because he was moved yeah. to. Thank you, Lord. So allow this. What we have to learn is that compassion allows us to work miracles. It's a key ingredient to work in miracles. You need a few things to make a cake. You need some flour, you need some egg, you need some sugar for sure. And butter, and you can make a cake. Well, there's the same thing with miracles. There's ingredients needed. Compassion is one. Amen? Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Or go to Matthew 20. We'll come back to 15. Go to Matthew chapter 20. Start with verse 30. It says, Behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. The multitude warned them that they... Now, <clears throat> stop there for a second. Notice they were calling out for mercy. Same word for compassion, actually. And that word mercy and compassion translates to God, help me. For us, many times, we say, have mercy on me, God. And it, and it tends to do with sin. You feel like you've sinned a lot or you've, you've, you've slidden back or something. You say, oh, God, have mercy on me. But you can also use that term to get healed by God. 
And so can people. When people are calling out for mercy and compassion, it's the enacting, enabling power of God to take care of their problem. He loves us enough not to just give us a Hallmark card when we ask for mercy. Mercy, don't think of it as, I need some sympathy from you. You know, the carnal world needs sympathy. And they'll get mad at you if you don't give them sympathy at the right moment. But what I always look for as a Christian is I want, I want some serious mercy here. If you're going to do anything, do, make, it, make it count. Amen. I'm not against Hallmark cards, but um, they have their place. Yeah. I want to solve the problem. Then we have the congratulations, you're well card. How about that one? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. That's right. Amen. <clears throat> then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them, and he said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion. He had compassion and touched their eyes. He gave them what they wanted. They wanted mercy and compassion. That's what he gave. And touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Go back to Matthew 15. John Osteen wrote a book called The Divine Flow. And it has to do with love. The divine love of God coming out of you can destroy the works of Satan. Yes. The love of God never fails. The love of God is the most powerful force. Right. And so it's in you. It's inside you. But it takes some faith and some um, faith capacity for us to let it out. And so that's what we need to learn is that letting, helping a hurting person expects the love of God to come out and do something. It's the catalyst. It's one of the bridges for God's power. Uh, we'll talk about the next bridge, or the other bridge, in just a second. Matthew chapter 15 here, verse 32. Or no, let's read from verse 30. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself, and he says, I have compassion on the multitude, because they've continued with me three days. So here he's let the compassion out and healed everybody, but then he has more compassion. He says, I have compassion, they continue with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I don't want them to send them away hungry, lest they faint in the way. When his disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to feed such a great multitude? He said, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven and a few fish. And we know the rest of the story. He fed the thousands of people. Why? How did he work the miracle? Why did he get to work that miracle? Because he had compassion on the multitude. Did y'all hear that? Amen. The reason Jesus got to feed the 5,000 people, or this one, the 4,000 people, miraculously, because he had compassion. He didn't just wave magic wand. He wasn't just playing games. He did it because of compassion. Isn't that exciting? Amen. I dare to say that mere Christians can work miracles when we have compassion. Amen. Not just empathy, not just sympathy, but true divine compassion from heaven. It's in us. And when we let it out of us, it can work miracles. Amen. I remember I was at... Uh, R.W. Schambach's meeting, and he had a meeting in Humble, and we went to help him out. There was about 2,000 people in the Humble Civic Center, and um, <clears throat> they allowed the ministers to help out in different ways. Uh, we, we were doing some things to, to pray for the sick and all that. And one night, this is what he, uh, R.W. Schambach preached a good long message, and, and then he said, okay, ministers, come down to the front, and uh, we're going to pray for the sick people. So anyone who needs prayer, please come down. And so several scores of people, maybe a hundred, I don't know how many people came for healing, and they were all just standing at the altar. And so the ministers just went out and began to pray for sick people. So I, I went out with, with everybody, and I'm looking around to see who God wants me to pray for and help. And I found one guy, and he was kind of worshiping God, and he, he looked kind of intense. And um, <clears throat> that's kind of important. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he, he, was, he was seeking the Lord, I could tell. And so I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, sir, sir, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? What do you want God to do in your life? And he said, I'm here on behalf of my fiance. She's got stomach cancer and she's in the hospital. She couldn't come. I'm standing for her. And when he began to tell me the story, that was about it. He only told me about four or five sentences. And when he began to talk, all of a sudden this compassion just enveloped me. And uh, I started to weep. And he kept talking and he kept talking. 
and for just this short sliver of time, I had this, this divine love come over me. And I thought, oh, no. I mean, I just felt like I, got, I have to help him. And so I, I remember putting my hand into his stomach. And I just kind of bent down, and I was just kind of groaning inside myself and tearing a little bit and crying a little bit. And I just prayed as hard as I could and, and, and took authority over the devil and commanded the cancer to leave and, and just expressed my, my faith and my love for him. And uh, within about 30 seconds, it was done. Within 30 seconds, it all lifted. I wasn't crying anymore. I felt real good again. And uh, I said, well, something happened. I'm sure of it. And so that was it. And I went on and prayed for a few other people, and that was the end of the night, basically. Well, <clears throat> the next night, I'm standing at the tape, the uh, CD and book. I think back then it was still cassette tapes, but the tape and book table. And I was, uh, you know, manning one of the tables to sell things. And this man comes up with his fiance. And he says they wouldn't let her out of the hospital the night before because she's in too much pain. They were scared. He said, but here she is. She didn't have any more pain this morning, and so the doctors let her go. And <clears throat> we just wanted to give God the glory and thank you for praying. Well, that was it. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And so I gave him my card. I said, well, you call me when you get the full report. I wanted to know. I felt like something happened. I wanted to know the full story. And so about a, uh, about a month later, he calls and he says, well, I wanted to be one of those ten lepers that, called to, that came back to give God glory. He said they went in the next day and, and looked for the cancer and it was gone. Now, she had been in chemo for a little time, but they went and he, he made them do a test and they checked her and she had no more cancer whatsoever. Hallelujah. And he said, and I didn't tell you this, but when you put your hand in my stomach... He said, it hurt me so bad. I felt like there was a knife or something going through my stomach, and it hurt. He said, and then within about 20, 30 seconds, it disappeared. He said, so I knew something had happened to her. Amen. Isn't that exciting? <clears throat> Simply because of the love of God. Somebody's available, somebody's got the love of God, and then God can move. It's all about God getting to move through us. You know, Jesus said that. He said, it's the Father in me, he doeth the work. So don't take the pressure and the burden upon yourself no matter what. We learn a lot of these things so we can flow with God better. We learn all these little principles and secrets so that we can be in the right place at the right time and, and stay flowing and, and remove obstacles when necessary and be God's agent to get things accomplished this way. Praise the Lord. Turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 4. I mean, excuse me, Mark chapter 1. Over in Mark 5, there's another account. Jesus uh, delivered the demoniac. Remember the Gerganses guy? And uh, set him free from his demons. And he said, now, now go tell uh, what good things the Lord has done for you and how he, how he has had compassion on you. Praise God. Even setting a demon pers demonized person free, it has to do with compassion. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? In Luke 7, Jesus found... Uh, the, the lady of the city of Nain. Her, her son had died and they were carrying, they were in the funeral procession and Jesus walked up next and she's crying and weeping. He said, don't weep. And he had compassion on her and he touched the coffin and raised the dead son up. So Jesus raised a dead person how? Because he had compassion on mama. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 1. Did y'all get there first? One time I was, uh, I got a phone call from an old friend of mine, a uh, childhood friend, and she was married and, and she had gotten pregnant, first child, and uh, she called me up and I knew she was pregnant and she was, she was in about the fifth or sixth month or something like that, and she calls crying. She says, the doctors have diagnosed my son has some sort of cerebral palsy or some sort of deformity and he'll, his brain will never be developed and it won't even come together. I don't remember all the details. But as she began to talk, the same thing happened to me. I just, I broke on the inside. And on the inside of me, I'm screaming on the inside, no, 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 not my, no, not my, no, this cannot happen. I will not let this happen. And, and just out of, just began to cry and weep for about another 30 seconds. And I, and I said, hold on, stop, 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 stop. And I just began to pray and take authority over that thing and just let the love of God go through the phone. And within 30 seconds, it broke. I felt good again. I said, well, something's going to happen. You just go back to the doctor and let them check you. 
She calls me up about seven to ten days later. She said, well, I went back in this week, and they checked, and they said there's no, nothing wrong with the, the, the baby at all. They can't find any trouble whatsoever. He'll be normal. Isn't that exciting? And I know, that it, I, I know what happened. I felt that spiritual ingredient for miracles. And so when you, the key is when you notice it, use it. Amen. When you notice the love of God is jumping out for someone, use that. Hallelujah. Mix a little faith in there and let it go and watch what God does for people. Hallelujah. You know, God is love. So when, and He lives in you, doesn't He? He is love. He lives inside of us. So when He wants to reach out and touch, it's going to be in the form of love. It's not going to be in the form of glory. God's not working miracles so He can get glory. There you go. Did you know that? Amen. Did you know God's not working miracles so He can get glory? If He wanted to do that, He could get some glory, couldn't He? That's not His motive for miracles. Now, as an after result, He will get some glory. And it's right to do so, but that's not why He does miracles. If He wanted some glory, He could just show up today. Jesus could appear to every single human being today and get some glory that all hit the ground. They're going to do that one day. Every knee's going to bow, but... That's not what he's after. He's after relationship. He's after true, intimate love and relationship with people. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying, saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I'm willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I know everybody always wonders about the next scripture. He strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to him. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely. We'll get back to that. We'll explain that one, one, one day, one night. We'll explain why that is. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.14, don't turn there, says, The love of Christ compels us, constrains us, compels us, guides us, puts us in a tight space, and moves us toward the right thing. That's what the love of God does. The love of God will keep you from hurting people, and it will cause you to help people. And not just help them by giving them a, a pie or a little bit of money when they need it, but what about miraculous power? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got miraculous power in us. To let divine love be the agent to help you give that away. And, and know that, that God backs you up because that's Him. That's His will and that's how Jesus did it. Hallelujah. Now, how do we develop and ob how do we obtain first and develop this divine compassion? Um... Uh, let me quote Mark 6 to you, just tell you the story. Mark 6 is where, verse 48, is where Jesus stilled the storm. He stilled the storm, and we know he did it because he had authority, but the, and he was just kind of walking on the water just for fun, but not really. The truth is, the disciples were scared. Remember that? They were panicked, were perishing, and Jesus stilled the storm. I, I think it was because he had compassion on them. I dare to say it's because he cared for the the, the immediate well-being and peace of his disciples. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so how do we obtain and develop this divine compassion? First of all, the Holy Spirit has shed abroad the love of God in our hearts. Amen. Romans 5.5, 5, we already got the love of God. If you're a Christian, if you're born again, you have the love of God in you. You don't need to have a baptism of love. You don't need to have an anointing of love. There's no such a thing. <laughs> you're just anointed with love. No. You got the, every Christian's got the love of God in there. He put it in there the moment you got born again. Now, sometimes your outer shell is so crusty it can't get out. It's the truth. Our outward man sometimes is so locked up with pride and insecurity and, and self-consuming, you know, life events that we, we, we can't minister. We don't think about people. We're thinking about, you know, me, myself, and I, and, and all my duties. But if you'll just let your outer man fall to the ground a bit, put yourself under, uh, consider others more than yourself. Yes. 
If you'll do that, then the love of God can get out. At least that's one important uh, aspect of it. But if you want to develop that love of God to where it can break through, you're going to have to do some spiritual things. You're going to have to think about it. You're going to have to want it. You're going to have to ask God to help you. You're going to have to follow the Spirit of God as you develop the love of God. And you're going to have to pray in tongues. Jude chapter 20 is a very important scripture. Let's go ahead and turn there real fast. Jude 20. You're going to have to meditate on the love of God. You're going to have to think about it. I remember when I first walked with the Lord, I was excited about the things of faith and I understood hope pretty well. Uh, faith and hope work together. You can't really have any miracle without a faith and a hope. And, uh, but I realized, you know, faith, hope, and love, all three exist, and I don't have a whole lot of love. And I'd come out of the world just like all of you. And uh, I was a good person on the inside, but you know what? I didn't understand the love of God. And so I started understanding the things of God, and I prayed one day. I remember I said, Lord, I have a lot of faith. I know I do, and I got some hope. I know I do, but I don't know about love. I feel like I'm lacking a little bit. Will you give me some more love? Now, he, had, he didn't need to give me more. He would already put it in me. But he... I needed it to de be developed. I needed it to come to the surface. I needed to get deeper in the things of, of divine love. So I asked him. And uh, I want you to know within, within a couple weeks, something happened on the inside of me. And I was walking down the street. I was walking into the office one day in Atlanta, Georgia. I had a client. I was working at, at a certain client in, in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I'm walking into the building. And somebody passed me on the sidewalk. And I, and I looked at him and I thought, Oh, I wonder if they're saved. I wonder if they need any help. And my, my heart just kind of broke for them. And I just kept walking. You know, now I'd probably stop and run over to them. But I recognized I had something special. I recognized there's something different in me. I'm not just an old guy from the world that is excited about God. I got some divine nature in me. That's important for us. Hallelujah. All right, Jude chapter 20. Here, This will help you develop the love of God in you. And if you don't do this, you'll lack. You'll lack. Jude chapter 0 or chapter 1 verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What, what's, your most holy what's the most holy thing you can do by faith? Pray in the Holy Spirit. You know, it takes faith to pray in the Spirit. Yeah. The natural man says, what in the world are you doing? You're wasting time. Can't understand nothing that you're saying. It takes faith to pray in the Spirit, and it's called your most holy faith. Glory. 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 So when you pray in tongues, you're doing a very holy thing. Yes. Build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Notice how they're linked there. Praying in the Holy Spirit will help you help spiritually uh, dig deep and develop the love of God within you. Hallelujah. The more you pray in tongues, the more compassion you'll have for people. Glory. The less you pray in tongues, the more hardened you'll be towards the cares of people towards the hurts of society, towards even the lost. We apply this also to winning the lost. If you really want to win the lost and care about sinners, you're going to have to pray in tongues. Okay? Praying in tongues is an is a added benefit that Holy Ghost-filled people get. And if you don't want to pray in tongues to get the love of God, you're going to have to spend a lot more time meditating on the love of God. Or just be some spectacular Christian that just doesn't have any problem loving people. Amen? I'm sure there's some that's had a lot of love and didn't have the Holy Spirit baptism and speak with tongues. But if you do, then you use that tool. Amen. You want to be obedient and faithful with the gift of God. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. The second spiritual motivator that Jesus had is um, <clears throat> found in Hebrews chapter 1. Turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 1. You know, we think Jesus had all this power because He was the Son of God. Uh, and that's a partial reason. But we think He was just the special one. And that's part of the reason. We think He was just prophesied to be the Messiah with power. And, and that's part of the reason. But there's also a more specific reason. See, God always follows spiritual principles. Amen. God gives His Word and He follows that Word. Sometimes we get to thinking that God can just do anything He wants, anytime He wants, to anybody He wants, and it's all up to Him. We'll just, you know, we just nothing. We don't know what's going on. But that's not how God works. God has told us how He's going to do things, and He's going to do them that way. 
He has set up spiritual rules and principles and guidelines that even he himself has to follow. Right. Has to follow. Why does he have to follow his rules? Because he can't lie. If he said it, he has to do it because he can never lie. Amen. And so we have to recognize that with God, that there's always some spiritual secrets about things. We see a miracle happen, and somebody says, well, it's all just up to God. No, no, there's secret ingredients that happened. There's some special things that we need to investigate, because you can see them in the miracles of Jesus, in the few sentences of the testimonies. You can see the secrets in there. You can see the, the, uh, uh, the principles that were followed by, by a human, and that's what we're after. We can get all those things together and find some patterns and principles and understand this a little bit better so that we get better results. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us how come Jesus had some special stuff going on. Notice this. But, but to the son, verse 8, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness or iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Yes. 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 So, Therefore, your God has anointed you. Why? Because you loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God anointed you. So if you want to be anointed, guess what? Love righteousness and hate iniquity and lawlessness. He anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Jesus was anointed with the oil of the Holy Ghost because he loved what was right and he hated what was wrong. And because of that, Amen. there were some special miracles he got to do. Right. Turn with me to, um, let's go to Matthew. No, let's, yeah, Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 21. Let me just give you a, a little synopsis on uh, the, 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 the loving righteousness and hating, hating iniquity. That's throughout the Bible. Loving righteousness and hating iniquity. Hate, hating, Hating iniquity is the nature of God, right. the mind of God. God hates evil. Did you know God hates some things? He hates evil. And we find this theme throughout the Bible. And it's called, to love righteousness and hate iniquity is called the fear of the Lord. That is the fear of the Lord, the respect of the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Remember that scripture? Right. Pride, arrogancy, the evil way, the forward mouth, these things do I hate. And then Proverbs 6.16, Six things does the Lord hate, yet hate. Yes, even seven are abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, uh, uh, hands that shed innocent blood, and s feet that are swift to running to mischief, and a, he that sows discord among the brethren. God hates that stuff. If ever you're going to sow discord among the brethren and gossip about your fellow man, you better recognize God hates that stuff. Amen. And if you ever try to, if you ever think you're going to gossip about your brother and sister, sow discord among the brethren and get healed, and get great blessing, I'd stay away from the things the Lord hates. Amen. All right. <clears throat> this is what the Lord told me one time. He said, son, he said, if you will learn to, to do this, to love righteousness and hate iniquity, if you, will, if you will practice hating the works of the devil, sin, sickness, and every other work of Satan, if you will learn to do that, you will be free from those works and help others get free from those works. Hallelujah. 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 It lights some fire in you when you do it right. It, the, when you follow these principles, it lights some fire on the inside and allows you to work some miracles. So you can take the compassion of God and you can take this fear of the Lord and you can override your thought of, well, maybe I just don't have enough faith. Well, maybe I'm just not quite holy enough. Take these things and override all those doubts and unbeliefs so that you can help the hurting world. All right. <clears throat> Are we in Matthew 21? I'm not there yet. I'll quote some more while I'm turning there. Uh, Romans 12, 9 says, To abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Remember that scripture? Abhor, hate that which is evil. Psalm 97, 10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate 
evil. Hate evil. Now, what's evil? Did we talk about it last week? Hate e What is evil? Is it just Dracula and the mummy and scary movies? Is it just Satan worshipers and, and really wicked things? No, anything that's of, not of God is evil. Amen. He gives us a list of things, and a lot of it has to do with relationship. Yeah. Pride, arrogancy, the evil way, the forward mouth, strife among the brethren. Those are heart issues. He hates those. Those are evil things. Amen. I mean, so is witchcraft, and so is Satan worship and all that. But these heart issues are very serious matters yeah. to the church. Yeah. Yeah. Psalm 25 says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He'll show them His covenant. So if you want to know the secrets... You're going to have to fear the Lord. That means you're going to have to hate the things He hates and love the things He loves. That helps us tap into the power of God. Hallelujah. Matthew 21, verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God, drove out all the, those who bought and sold in the temple, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And He said to them, It's written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to Him in the temple, and He healed them. Did you ever notice those two things were linked? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He got in there and he overturned the money changers and then he healed all the sick people. Hallelujah. Look at Matthew chapter 12. One scripture said, the ze Jesus said, The zeal of my house has eaten me up. Glory. The zeal of my house has eaten We need to have the zeal of God eat us up. The zeal of the church. The zeal of the kingdom of God. All things that are right needs to eat us up on the inside. It needs to burn like everlasting fire on the inside. That's what Jeremiah said. I got fire shut up in my bones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't felt the fire of God on the inside of your bones in a long time, you need to, you need to stay a little longer. Amen. You need to hang out with God just a little bit longer. Right. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 14, Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Hallelujah. Notice that. Here they had some evil going against him. He went and healed people. Like right in the face. Oh, you're going to do some evil? I'm going to heal some sick people then. <laughs> Devil, you're going to mess with me? You're going to start doing some unrighteous things? I'm going to go fix some people then. Just right in your face. Hallelujah. Turn to Mark chapter 3. Yes, we can use that. Glory. I'm telling you, this is, you see this throughout. There's patterns. Acts chapter 4. Remember, this is after they got persecuted. They got told and commanded and beaten not to talk about Jesus and preach in His name. And they got had a prayer meeting and they said, Lord, behold their threatenings. Yeah. Now grant us power that in the name of Jesus yeah. we can do miracles. Signs and wonders. Remember that? Behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Remember that? Notice how those two things are connected, aren't they? Notice that Philip, remember in Acts chapter 8, the, the persecution of Paul caused the church to scatter. I mean, they were in a tough predicament. Charles caused the church to scatter. Philip says, that's it, I'm going to Samaria, I'm going to heal all the sick people there. <laughs> and he did it. Caused revival. Yes. Amen. Friction never hurt the church, never hurt Jesus. It always fired him up. Amen. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Mark chapter 3. Look at verse 1. He entered into the synagogue and a man there that had a withered hand, so they watched him closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. And he said to the man that had the withered hand, Step forward. Then he said to him, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to, e to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. When he had looked around about them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Why did he do the miracle? He's fed up with the Pharisees. Didn't say anything about the man having faith. The man wasn't even asking for anything. Jesus, Jesus just decided, you know what, all you folks? I'm just going to work a miracle. Let's just fix this guy right here. I'm going to challenge you. I can see what you're thinking. I know what you're up. I know what you're saying. I know what's in your heart. I'm just going to fix this guy right in your face. Hallelujah. 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 
I like that kind of stuff, don't you? I like that kind of stuff. My friend Angelo, <clears throat> he tells a story. I wasn't with him at the time, but he was in New York City along the boardwalk of Long Island. And he, he was there for an R.W. Shambach crusade. He was working the prayer tent, doing all the things there for evangelism. He said, but he and his team went down to the boardwalk, and they were winning some souls and things, and they saw uh, a, a booth set up on the boardwalk of Muslims. And uh, he didn't know it was Muslims at the time, but he saw this booth, and he saw a, a picture of Jesus uh, you know, on a poster or something. And so he started walking over there and seeing, and he got closer. He could tell it was Jesus, supposed to be Jesus, you know. And he got up closer and he could see that on his forehead had 666 on Jesus' forehead. And it was these Muslims trying to make converts out there. He said, that got my Greek and Holy Ghost blood boiling. <laughs> he said, so I ran back to the tent, got my whole team, and he went to Kinko's and he got a banner made. And the banner is this huge. We got a, we, I've, I've seen pictures of the banner. It's like a 15-foot banner. And it said, whose God is the real... Well, this way. Whose God is the real God? If your God is, can you prove it? And he had all the false gods, Buddha and Muhammad. He had all the names on there and Hare Krishna and all these things. He said, my God heals people of sickness and disease. And he listed off sickness and diseases. And he, and he, went, he went down to the boardwalk and he set up his tent and his booth right next to the Muslim booth. And he got his bullhorn and began to preach that message. Whose God is the real God? We're here to see. So he challenged them face to face and, and his team were stopping people in the boardwalk praying for the sick and miracles started happening. Amen. This went on for 30 minutes, an hour or so. He looked over and the Muslim booth was gone. He didn't even realize it. Amen. You know, the church needs a bit of fire, don't you think? The church needs some fire that burns through all of the uh, political etiquette and the, the societal etiquette, which is, oh, then nobody really wants us to knock on their door. Nobody really wants to talk about religion, you know, so we'll just protect their freedoms and let them go straight to hell. How about that? How about the right to go to heaven? They ought to put that in the Bill of Rights. You have a right to go to heaven. You have a right to hear the gospel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then we see over in Acts chapter 16, this is the story when the demonized lady, the fortune teller, was following Paul on his crusade. And she's preaching the gospel and bothering them. These are the servants of the Most High God. Hear ye them. And after many days, the Bible said Paul was grieved. The Bible says Paul was grieved, annoyed, the New King James says. He was annoyed and he turned to the Spirit and he said, Come out of her, you unclean spirit. And it came out and he got put in prison for it. Why did he do that miracle? He's fed up with it. Yeah. He's fed up with unrighteousness. Hating iniquity. When you get bothered by some things, you can cause good things to happen. Not bothered with people. Bothered with the devil. In that account, he didn't say to her. He wasn't against her. She's just possessed. Yeah. He said to the spirit, come out of her. Amen. Don't get mad at people and retaliate against people. Get mad at unrighteousness and retaliate against Amen. Satan. Amen. This does not give the Christian a right to lose his temper all the time about, you know, the kids didn't clean the room, so I lost my temper just like Jesus did, you know, when he overtook them. No, no. This does not give the Christian a right to lose himself. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's right. <clears throat> now, let's go to key number two. Key number two. It takes faith. Every miracle, every healing, every deliverance requires faith. Yes. It always requires faith. Amen. It always requires faith. Mm -hmm. We have seen even Christians who had deep sympathy and love for a sick person in their family and no miracle happened. They had deep, heartfelt, almost divine. I mean, if it was true divine love, it had some faith in there. You know, faith works by love. Yeah. And, uh, but no miracles happened. So it can't happen just because of tears. Yeah. Miracles don't happen just because of tears, just because of the need. If it was just because of the need, all the crying people starving in every country, they'd have food. Mm -hmm. That's true. God doesn't do anything because there's a need. Did you know that? Amen. That's true. Well, He knows I need it. He does. He knows everybody's needs, even before you ask. But God has set up this system of connecting with Him. He set up this system of contacting heaven. He set up this system of miracle working power from Him to us. Yes. He set up this system on a thing called faith. faith. 
a thing called absolute confidence, a thing called fully persuaded, fully convinced, unwavering, mm -hmm. not double-minded, full blood confidence in God yes. before He can do any miracle. If you watch throughout Scripture, all the miracles required a human involvement. The human had to believe. The human had to hear from God. The human had to act on what God has said. We always say God did everything, but really it was God and His partner did everything. Which partner? Well, the partners that He needed. He needed Noah to build the ark before He could work the miracle. Amen. He needed Moses to stretch the rod before He could part the Red Sea. Matter of fact, He told Mo Moses crying out to God to do a miracle. And that's where the church has failed miserably. We have failed miserably. Oh God, work a, oh God, we need a miracle. Oh God. God looked at Moses. He says, why are you crying to me? You stretch forth your rod and you divide it. That's true. That's true. You use the authority. I gave you the authority. That's why Jesus gave you the authority. So we're over here crying at God to do something. He says, why don't you do it? I already gave you the authority. Yeah, that's true. No, no Red Sea parted until Moses stretched the rod. Amen. A human had to uh, believe God and obey God. That's true. That's true. It does put responsibility on us, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And that's usually why people shy away from this message and, and the works of Jesus is because it does put a little bit of responsibility yeah. to believe and act. Right. Put your name on the line. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. But I just want you to know it always takes faith. Never in the Bible do you find, never, 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 not once did you find in the Bible when a miracle took place that the reason uh, was stated because of my sovereign will. That's true. God never said that. He never said because I am God, I have worked this miracle. It was always something else like because of your faith, because of your obedience. Make sense? Yes. You have to admit that. And you can go through the Bible and you can try to find a place where there's a miracle without any human involvement. You won't find them. Amen. Except creation. That's about it. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> there's some things I don't know. I don't know what those are, but I'm sure that there's things I don't know. <laughs> I am not saying that I know everything God knows. <laughs> and I'm not saying... <laughs> I mean, if I knew what they were, I'd know them then. <laughs> even even the, the, the closest one I can find to the sovereignty of God is the pool of Bethesda, where at a certain season, an angel from heaven came down and stirred the waters. And the first person that stepped in after the moving of the waters was made whole. Still took people to show up at the pool. Till, still took a human being to believe something and jump in and use his faith to get through that crowd and make it in sick. Even that one required a human's involvement. If it was only God, he could have healed them all at home. But this, uh, this leads us to the question... Faith is needed, but whose faith is needed? When we found out all these truths about receiving healing and miracles by faith, the Christian realized, I've got to have some faith to get healed. But then now that we're looking into the ministry of Jesus as a believer in his shoes, I have to go a little further than just knowing a sick person needs faith. Okay, so whose faith is needed for the miracle? Well, it's pretty clear that the sick person uh, can get healed by his faith. We have several examples of that. But I want to say this, that sometimes Jesus' faith was the only faith used. Mm -hmm. We just read an account with the withered hand guy. Yeah. Jesus had 95% of the faith needed for that. The, all the man had to do was obey one command. Does that make sense? Yeah. So sometimes, or several cases, you find that only Jesus had faith. Yeah. We call it Jesus' faith or the believer's faith. There are times when believers can work miracles for someone else based on their own faith. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. We know the will of God. We have the power of God. Other people don't know yet. Other people are babes. Other people not even in yet. Sometimes sinners need to be healed. We can heal them on our faith. Uh -huh. yeah. Not always, but sometimes. Right. Yeah. 
And then sometimes people are healed because of a friend's faith or a mediator, we could say. Yeah. Just like the man I told you about. He came for his fiance. She was healed because of his faith. Does that make sense? And so you know some of these examples. Let's go ahead and take a look at Mark chapter 3 since we're there. <clears throat> oh no, we already read that one really. Do I need to read that again? No, we already read that. Um, Jesus decided to work the miracle. And the man was blessed because of Jesus' faith. Turn with me to John chapter 5. John 5. One time I was in, uh, I was in Jacksonville, Texas, preaching in a church. And uh, I had preached the message, had the altar call, and several people came up. And one of the ladies came up to me, and she walked straight up. And she looked me in the eye, and she said, I don't believe any of this, but uh, if you can help me, help me. I got a toothache. I got a severe toothache, but I don't believe in this divine healing stuff. But go ahead and pray for me. <laughs> That's what she said. And at the time, I just, I had it. I mean, I knew I could do this. I had the faith to do that. Now, there's other times I didn't have much faith to do it. But at this time, she came up and said that to me. And I said, oh, you just want to get healed on my faith? She said, yeah, if I can. And I said, you can. And I touched her. I just grabbed her jaw and commanded the thing, the tooth infection to go away. And I said, now, how do you feel? I felt the power of God. And sometimes when you feel the power, you know something happened. Sometimes you feel the power and it didn't happen, but many times it did. And so I, I could feel it. And I said, so how do you feel now? She said, I can't believe this. She said, I just can't believe this. I don't have any pain at all. I can't believe this. And she walked. I said, well, praise the Lord. So I went on the next person. She walked off. I just can't believe this. I just can't believe this. I can't believe this. At the end of the service, I was at the back shaking hands or whatever, and uh, everybody was exiting, and she walks past me, and she says, she looks at me, she says, I just, I still can't believe this. I just can't believe this. Now, how'd she get healed? Well, she got healed on my faith, but she did come. She did come, and so that, that's a good, that's at least a half a step. I mean, that's at least a 5% of the 100% faith that's needed for a miracle. So combination can, can work. I mean, the sick person sometimes does need to come. Make sense? So you can't just run over to the, any hospital at any time and, and empty it. You can't do that. <laughs> Not even Jesus could do that. Not even Jesus could do that. Now, don't, lock the, don't, don't run out and get mad at me. I'm telling you, not even Jesus could go empty hospitals. We'll get, we'll get more into that right here. Look at uh, Luke chapter 7. Oh, wait, did we read John 5? Well, let's read it. John 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. This is waiting for the moving of the water. When, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was also the Sabbath. Stop there. Notice, Jesus is going to have a conversation with him. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we need to have some conversations so we pull people out of their, their, their mental state. So he's having a conversation with him. And the man is definitely not believing anything. Uh, you know, he's complaining that he can't even get in the water. He's already grumbling that he never gets anything. He certainly didn't have any faith. So he got healed because of Jesus, didn't he? Yeah. But he did obey Jesus. Yeah. So there was something required of that man anyway. But Jesus' faith is what triggered that whole thing. Without Jesus doing that, that man is still there. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Waiting, for, <clears throat> waiting for somebody to be nice and let him in. Okay, John, uh, Luke chapter 7, go there. Luke chapter 7, verse 13. This is the city of Nain. When he came near, the Lord said to her, he had, uh, he, he saw, uh, let's read verse 12. <clears throat> when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. 
Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried who carried with carried him stood still. And he said, "Young man, I say to you, arise." So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Who worked this miracle? How come this miracle took place? Jesus' faith. Jesus had faith. He had compassion, but he also had the faith to do it. Isn't that interesting? So we always know that if we're sick, we need to have some faith. So since you're here hearing this, uh, me, hearing this message, you need to have faith to get yourself healed. Yes. Yes. I had one guy one time, he, we were teaching some of these things, and he said, oh, I'm so glad I don't need any faith. And he didn't get a miracle either. He, he, wanted, he wanted all the responsibility off him. He wanted to kick back and see if he'd get something, and he didn't get anything. So don't, don't use that. If you, if you heard the message, then you still need some faith. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Acts chapter 3. John chapter 11 is when Jesus raised Lazarus. You know, Lazarus didn't have any faith. He's dead. So if you're going to raise a dead person, you're going you're to need some faith. Quite a bit, matter of fact. Acts chapter 3, you need to see this. This is Peter and John at the gate of the temple. After Jesus rose, they're going to go work some miracles. They've already won 3,000 people to the Lord. Verse 1, Acts 3, 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of, uh, from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. It's a very important, go ahead and underline, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Now, let's dissect this just a bit. Notice, after Peter said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, the very next scripture did not say, so he jumped up and walked. Because the man really didn't have much faith. He didn't even know what he's about to get. If he'd have had faith, he'd have jumped right up expecting it. Verse 7, however, is in between verse 6 and 8. Verse 7 says, He, Peter, took him by the right hand and lifted him up. So if you're going to pray for sick people, sometimes you're going to have to get them over the hump with your own faith. Amen. Yep. If they haven't come expecting full, complete healing, sometimes you're going to have to get it for them. You're going to have to use your own faith, just like Sister Rose did. The first person she ever prayed for, it was her neighbor, and she said uh, she found out he had a locked shoulder and a, and a shoulder that was in pain and locked. And uh, she said, well, Jesus will heal you. And then what have I just said? And so he said, really? And she said, yeah, let's pray. So she prayed for him. And then Sister Rose took his arm and yanked it up. And he was healed. Glory. Isn't that exciting? Glory. Hallelujah. And she hadn't even been to Bible school yet. She hadn't even got a seminary ticket yet. <clears throat> so there's other keys in this. We'll uh, get to them maybe in just a moment. Um, so the miracle took place because Peter had some faith. Just know that, that you can do certain... Now, there are limits to what you can do for another. There are limits to what we can do for another who has no faith. Okay? Number one, they're going to have to give you permission. Yeah. Number two, th th it's really tough if they have severe obstacles. And we're going to talk about obstacles later on. There's some severe obstacles that will just hinder everything. Okay? If they don't have any of those severe resisting obstacles, you can get it for them sometimes. Yeah. But you can't just get it for anybody anytime. Can't run to the hospital and just empty it out. There would, it would require a lot of ministry to a person sometimes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're going to get into some of the, the particulars, but just recognize you can do it for some people, but you can't always do it for everybody. Yeah. 
We can't all sit here and decide, okay, we're going to get so-and-so healed. Let's just all pray and make it happen. That, ha that works a little bit sometimes. But don't think that mass prayer chains is the answer for miracles. Amen. Have you noticed they're not the answer for miracles? Uh -huh. Amen. The, the, false, the false thought, the wrong teaching, uh, the wrong doctrine is the more people we have praying, the better chance there is. And that's not true. You can't find any Bible scripture about that. But we've, you know, relied on that and leaned on that because we didn't know any better. So if we can just get everybody praying, then it, no, that's not what gets it to work. What makes miracles happen? Faith makes miracles happen. Ingredients make miracles happen. And the sick person many times is going to have to have some faith. Turn to um, Matthew 9 with me. Matthew chapter 9. This is the story of the lady with the issue of blood. Matthew 9, verse 20. Suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was well from that hour. Notice that Jesus didn't have to use any faith for this miracle. It was strictly done by the faith of the sick woman. That makes sense? She pulled the power out just by her own desperate belief that Jesus had it. You can pull it out from Jesus yourself with your own faith. If you can't do that at home, then you get some help. Get a friend to pray with you. Come get the elders of the church. Get the pastor to pray for you. Get somebody. That's fine too. But just recognize your faith can get your miracle. Their faith can get their miracle. People out there, their faith can get their miracle. Uh, look here at... Well, Matthew 9, same thing here. Verse 27, two blind men followed. Jesus said the same thing. Verse 29, according to your faith, let it be done unto you. Luke chapter 6, 19 says, the whole multitude sought to touch him. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Amen. <clears throat> Matthew, let's go to the next. So the sick person's faith absolutely gets miracles. Thank you, Jesus. They need to have faith many times. But look at the next one, the mediator's faith. A mediator, a go-between, an intercessor, a stand-in. Yeah. The man stood in for his fiancée and she got healed. Matthew chapter 8, the centurion came for his servant and his servant was healed. And Jesus said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in all Israel, be it done unto you. To the centurion for his servant and his servant was healed the self-same hour. Yes, thank you. Does that make sense? Somebody's faith is always needed though. Don't ever mistake it. Somebody's faith is always needed. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9, this is Jairus, when he came for his daughter, and his daughter was raised from the dead because of daddy's faith. Daddy and mama can always get miracles for their children as long as their children are children. Amen. At some point, those children grow up and become their own person. They begin to uh, uh, have their own consciousness of life, uh, usually during the puberty age, at some point. In the teenage year, the, that child uh, falls out from under the authority of the parent. This is one of the principles we have to admit and recognize and, and work to our advantage. That uh, not anybody can get a miracle for anybody else. There must be some sort of submission in that relationship they have. Does that make sense? Yes. Mama and daddy can get it for kids, but once those kids become adults... Mom and daddy can't do it anymore. Those kids are then responsible for their own life between them and God, and it's very difficult. Yep. Amen? Amen. The lady in Matthew chapter 15 that came for her demon-possessed daughter, Jesus talking to her, Jesus didn't just run over and, and set the girl free. He talked to mama. He worked with mama's faith because mama's faith was vitally important. Mama's faith was vitally important for the, daughter's, for the daughter to be set free of the demon. Does that make sense? With kids that are under their parents' authority, you have to go through mom and dad mostly. Most of the time, you've got to go through mom and dad. If you ever pray for a kid who uh, doesn't seem to get healed, better find mom and dad immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Mom and dad, there's an obstacle. There's a sticking point with mom and dad somehow. We used to take people out to the streets in Aleph and 
preach the gospel on the loudspeaker and pray for sick people. And one time we had we pulled in with our team and our truck and food. And we had a bunch of food this time. And I stood on the tailgate and began to preach the gospel and call people down. And we had um, parents coming out on the porch and kids running. We had like 30, 40 kids around the truck. And we're, you know, blessing them and taking care of them and having some fun and winning people to the Lord and praying for the sick and all that. When I, when I drove in there, I noticed there was a, a group of adults on one of the porches drinking beer and, and partying and stuff like that, which is no problem. We go right in the middle of those things. But I began to pray for the sick. And so I called any kids that needed to be prayed for to come up. And so two kids, I remember, came first. And they had both had asthma. Both of these children had asthma. And uh, so I began to talk to them a little bit and just tell them, Jesus is going to set you free right now. And I just stood there and commanded the spirit of asthma to lead these kids. And uh, felt the power of God, figured something had happened. I said, okay, run around that tree, both of you. They both took off running. They turned around, came back running. They're huffing and puffing and coming down. And they come right in front of me. And uh, the one, I'm looking at one, and he's, he's all happy. He's breathing fine. The other one I can see out of the corner of my eye, didn't even want to look at him. He's over, I'm thinking, oh no, I'm going to kill the kid. <laughs> He's having a hard time over on the side. <clears throat> and so I, I looked at the one that was healed and said, praise the Lord, you know, Jesus set him free. And I began to talk, ask the Lord, what's going on with this kid? What happened? I'll pray for him again if I need to. And the Lord said, find his mama. And I said, I said, hey, I said, are you okay? And he said, well, you know. And I said, well, where's your mom? Will you get your, go get your mom. Bring your mom over here. Because if I can get through mom, I can get him healed. See? Yeah. And he, run, he, he runs over to that porch where they were all partying. Which is, partying is not the problem. Yeah. Uh, you'll find the problem in just a second. So he brings mama over. And uh, she comes over and I explained to her. I said, I prayed for these two, these two boys. And one of them was instantly healed of his asthma. But your son wasn't healed yet. And I just want to talk to you because I want to pray for him again. Because I want you to know Jesus will set him free right now. She said, oh, yes, I know. God works miracles. I'm a Baptist. And I thank you very much for praying. And she walked off. That was it. Well, now I know what happened. Now I know where that little, why that little kid couldn't get his miracle. Because he's under mama's authority. Mama has a sticking point, not just an a ignorant standpoint, but a, a resistant standpoint. Does that make sense? So just recognize you're going to have to work with the parent if you're going to get children healed many times. Sometimes, and I don't know if I've seen this many times, but occasionally a grandparent can get a miracle for their grandkid, but only if mama and daddy aren't sticking. If mom and dad have some real serious doubts and resistant rebellions toward God, it's very, very difficult because that... They're, the kids either are blessed by parents or cursed by parents. Kids are under the influence of the parent. They're under the responsibility and the authority of the parent, whether we like it or not. We look at kids and we say, those little innocent kids, you know, they don't deserve this. Well, I know that, but that's how the system works. Alcoholic parents harm kids, don't they? Parents without faith harm kids. Parents with doubts harm kids. Parents that don't do any spiritual thing for their family harm kids, and kids suffer. Yeah. Amen? That's true. That's <clears throat> Mark chapter 2. Oh, wait, no, we're in Matthew still, right? Yeah, go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Verse 1, again he entered into Capernaum, and after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house, immediately many, many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Notice the mediator, the four friends, is the reason this miracle took place. It says when, there, when he saw, verse 5, when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, who had faith? Well, we know the four friends did because they brought him. And we, we, he might have had faith. We don't know. He could have been, take me home, take me home. Or he could have had some confidence as well. We don't know. The bottom line is we know that those friends had something to do with this miracle because when Jesus saw their faith, he worked it. And that brings us to the very next principle, which is you need to perceive the situation. You need to perceive people's faith. 
You need to detect That's good. faith or doubt. 